The Power Rangers are just pretend, you know, <laughs> comic book. What are those things? I can't believe it, but I think they're... It's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've been certified turtle-fied. <laughs> this ship is officially a green machine. <laughs> Hold on to your shells. <laughs> what is that? Wait a minute. You're asking a turtle who lives in a sewer to explain a cosmic event? Excellent! <laughs> we got our own spaceship! <laughs> Mega ship will self-destruct in 60 huh? seconds. Greetings, dear viewers, and welcome to Power Rangers in Space. Go, go, Power Rangers! Behind the scenes of Power Rangers Turbo, as I said last episode, there was some discontent in the production team about how to proceed with the Sentai footage they had. But if the idea of adapting a parody of Sentai into Power Rangers proved difficult, Mega Ranger, the Sentai that In Space was based on, proved even more of a challenge. Early production information that Saban had received about the series showed spaceships, concepts for space-themed designs, and the idea of fighting an evil alien force in the depths of space. The actual Sentai was nothing like that. No, in fact, the group stayed on Earth. Mega Ranger was a video game-themed Sentai. While they did have four spaceships that converted into giant robots, they never left Earth orbit. To make matters worse, the staff for the series had a reduced budget because of Turbo. Faced with these difficulties, the production team decided, screw it, it's the last season and we're gonna pull out all the stops anyway. They don't have footage of flying in space? Fine, we'll shoot it ourselves and have the model against a green screen. It looks terrible, but who cares, move on. Something that people often forget is that you don't need great special effects in order to carry a great show or movie. The special effects for In Space look bad, but the audience is willing to suspend their disbelief because the story is good. And the story for In Space is one of the biggest and best written in the entire show. Mind you, some of that is because of that ambition of it being the last season. The production team cared about the show, wanted to give it a proper conclusion after six years of a continuing story. And how much they cared is pretty evident in the final product. The season begins with the two-parter from Out of Nowhere. At the Sumerian planet, there's a gathering of the United Alliance of Evil. The villains of the show are all here. Zed, Rita, Master Vile, Mondo, Machina, General Havoc, and of course, Divatox. Mondo and Machina don't look like they're in the best of shape, which is understandable. I'd say it's likely that the Alliance only recently rebuilt them, and given the state of the Empire at the end of Zeo, they're probably in no position to strike out on their own again. Divatox is gloating about her victory over the Power Rangers when she runs into Rita. This is where we also learned that none of the female villains get along. At all. How wonderful to see you. Frida. It's Rita! Though it is quite a refreshing breath of air when Rita tries to attack Divatox with her staff. However, the blast is intercepted by a new villain in silver and black leather. This is Astronema, and she really makes a good first impression in these early scenes. Silent, menacing, and mysterious. The only downside is that in the early episodes, when she does speak, they really had her chewing the scenery. I think they should have kept her quieter and only go over the top when she failed. What are you doing here? Quantrons, throw him off my dark fortress. Mm. Still, like I said, the very first time we see her, it's quite well done. Also among them is a figure wearing a very concealing robe who just walks around the evil forces, watching, waiting, and observing. This is also a good time to talk about the theme song. Ron Wasserman once more brings his talents to it, and like all of his work, is pretty damn addicting. Especially the beginning countdown, and the raw cheesy glory of declaring, IN SPACE! RANGERS IN SPACE! Controls to outer space now. Also a nice touch for the first episode is that Divatox is still listed as the villain, and the new Red Ranger isn't revealed, keeping it a surprise for the events that unfold. The rest of the music in the season is mixed for me. It doesn't have quite the same epic rock feel as previous seasons, using a lot more of this kind of synth stuff that's like an old MIDI file. It's not bad, it's just a bit of a downgrade in my opinion. Though there are some fights where we have a more old school feel, including a weird version of Go Go Power Rangers that I've been unable to find as an isolated track, as in not just ripped from the episode. Go Go Power Rangers! Go Go Power Rangers! No idea where this came from or why it was made. 
The Alliance sits down for dinner, and we finally meet Dark Spectre, the creature responsible for capturing Zordon. And it turns out that it's Malagor from the Turbo Movie! Or rather, the Malagor costume. Yeah, cost-saving measures, I know, but every time I see him, I just wonder why they're fighting this guy again. Malagor explains that he's put Zordon in a lava chamber that will slowly extinguish his power and destroy him. Zed proposes a toast to Dark Spectre, and everyone drinks, except the figure in the cloak. When asked why he didn't join in the toast, Astronema points out that he's a spy, and the evil forces get to work. Goldar pulls off the guy's cloak and reveals... A Red Ranger. While I could joke about how obviously he can't drink it thanks to the helmet, it does make me realize, how hard is it for Zed to eat and drink through that grate? Anyway, the villains are in shock at this reveal, allowing the Rangers to leap onto a galaxy glider and fly off. Dark Spectre says that the Ranger has to be caught before he tells anyone about Zordon. Both Divatox and Rita volunteer to go after him. Hi. Remember me? You remind me so much of my fiance. <laughs> However, Dark Spectre gets tired of these shenanigans and charges Astronema with the task of finding and destroying the Ranger. Back in the shuttle, the Rangers gaze out into the vastness of space, still in pretty bad shape after what happened at the end of Turbo. TJ asks Alpha how much longer it'll take to get to Eltar, but it seems Alpha's voice chips were damaged in the explosion, and it's only now affecting him, so he can only speak in gibberish. Before they can worry about it for too long, the shuttle comes across a vessel in space that brings them on board. This is the Astro Megaship, the home of the Red Ranger we saw earlier. It's equipped with an artificial intelligence named Decca, who observes the group as they walk around. The Rangers explore the ship and eventually come to the bridge, looking for answers. The Red Ranger arrives, but believes the others are an attacking force, despite the group's pleas, and the fact that they are clearly a bunch of disheveled people in half-burnt clothes. Also, you'd think Decca would warn him about them being on board before he came in. The Rangers get trapped down below as Astronema attacks the megaship, disabling its engines. The Rangers manage to repair them, convincing the Red Ranger that they're on the up and up. Despite that, they crash on a nearby planet. Astronema lands, releasing her foot soldiers called Quantrons. The Quantrons are a huge step up from the Piranatrons. They're sleek and silver, carrying around huge blades, and instead of random imitation fish noises, we have a highly synthesized voice to give them a very robotic feel. <sighs> The Red Ranger goes out to face the approaching forces, and the Rangers insist on coming along to help. They fight valiantly, but it's pretty apparent that without their powers, they're outclassed. The Red Ranger, however, manages to fight them off. He demorphs, revealing... Legolas! Or, rather, his name is Andros. Surprisingly, he's human. Earth isn't the only place where humans live. Yeah, but it's also kind of strange that evolution should just happen to create humans on two different planets. Unless my joke about the Goa'uld pyramid ship in Zeo was accurate. Quick, someone shout out Jaffa Kree and see what happens. He explains that he's from a space colony called KO-35. Ashley clearly crushes on him, a relationship that'll develop over the season. The group gets to work repairing both the ship and Alpha. Andros tells them about Zordon's situation, but refuses to let them help him seemingly because of their inexperience in space. An excuse that kind of falls flat when you later learn that outer space also has its own Old West. Alpha's voice is repaired, but now instead of speaking jive, it's back to a more high-pitched voice. It's not the same as Alpha 5's voice, but it's better than the original Alpha 6 one. I don't have a computer chip with his old voice. Oh, that's all right, Andros. I'm quite happy with this one, thank you. <laughs> hi yeah, 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 yeah. The Rangers head back to the shuttle, but Alpha is missing. Turns out he stayed behind on the megaship to convince Andros to join with the others. He makes a convincing argument, and Andros heads back to pick them up. The Quantrons attack again, capturing the Rangers and letting them meet Astronema for the first time, but Andros comes to the rescue. He gives the four their Astromorphers. All right, let's rock it. The only major changes here are that TJ becomes the Blue Space Ranger and Carlos the Black Space Ranger. I like the Space Ranger uniforms. They're pretty simple and streamlined, along with helmets that have a very alien look to them, if that makes any sense. I admit, I don't quite understand the color squares in the front of the outfits. Yeah, I know they match their colors, but why just a bunch of colored squares? But otherwise, they're cool. Astronema launches another attack with fighters, and the Rangers head back to the megaship. Alpha hooks the power chamber black box into the computer system, revealing that the shuttle and the megaship were always meant to hook together to form the Astro Megazord, as part of a plan set up by Zordon. This 
actually kind of makes sense. I never did understand why the Nasada director was so quick to trust Justin's word that the Power Rangers needed the shuttle, but it'd make sense if Zordon had contacted him in advance and made sure that the Rangers could use it in the event of an emergency where they needed to head into space. Well, I mean, besides for that time where they teleported through space to a ruined planet. The Astro Megazord is pretty cool too. As opposed to previous Megazords, it's just two objects, the Megaship and the Shuttle, instead of five Zords. And hey, considering how little screen time the Zords usually get operating as individual crafts, it's good that we keep things simple here. They destroy the attacking spacecraft and head back to Earth to make repairs to the megaship, Andros giving them spiffy little uniforms as well. Astronema, however, follows behind them, swearing to destroy the Earth as well. From out of nowhere is a superb start to the season, setting up how the Rangers get their powers and establishing the new status quo. Looking back on this after seeing the rest of the show's run, it seems like every really good season of Power Rangers is made in direct response to a poorer season, trying to take the good ideas from the bad seasons and improving upon them. In this case, it's a much better example of the team growing up than seen in Turbo. They have no mentor or wise sage to consult, they only have each other. Andros brings something new to the table as the lead Red Ranger, partially serving the mentor role because of his experience as a Space Ranger, and Alpha remains on hand to run the megaship whenever they go off on a mission. There's a real sense of optimism about their mission, that they will find Zordon, even though they have no idea where to start looking. In the next episode, we get Bulk and Skull's shtick for the season, searching for alien life forms with a new character named Professor Phenomenus. Phenomenus is a genius, but hampered by his own occasional bumbling behavior, and as such he makes a good match for Bulk and Skull. Lieutenant Stone is gone, and sadly so is the Juice Bar, a mainstay of the show for five years. Admittedly, it's disappointing to lose, if just for the familiar atmosphere. They try to make a new place, the surf spot, but it's just not the same. Some were upset that in my original version of this video back in 2010, I didn't mention Adele Ferguson, the proprietor of the surf spot. And now I have mentioned her. Look, the thing is, she really doesn't do anything in the season, which is kind of my complaint about the entire idea of having the surf spot at all. With the juice bar, there were plots centered around activities happening there, tied in with the fact that the rangers, as teenagers, would hang out at the youth center, and their subplots as teenagers would help drive forward the monster of the day and whatnot. Ernie and Lieutenant Stone would help support and drive other things, usually comedic subplots done by Bulk and Skull. Here, the surf spot is just... A place they sometimes go to. And the weirdest part is that it's just a redress of the youth center anyway. Why bother changing it? In turn, not sure exactly why they let go of Lieutenant Stone, though I've read that the writers felt like he, Miss Appleby, and Principal Kaplan were just not needed anymore. And they're not entirely wrong. As the season goes on, the Rangers continue to mature to the point where they are pretty much adults, to the point where it seems they graduate from high school off screen. Early in the season, we actually do have the final times we ever see Angel Grove High School. Even include some old school kind of plots before disappearing altogether. But yeah, it makes no sense that the Rangers are still in high school when we frequently see the group staying overnight in the megaship while they continue their searches for Zordon. Having them still be in high school raises all sorts of questions, not the least of which being where the hell their parents think they are. To my utter irritation, Elgar is assigned to work with Astronema, though fortunately he has a considerably reduced role. Unlike Divatox, Astronema doesn't put up with Elgar's crap. You see, I would uh, build a machine so big that it would take- hmm. You talk too much. While on Earth, Andros reveals that he has telekinetic abilities. Ah, new types. Those humans in space really do bring out such abilities. He admittedly doesn't use them very often later in the series, and because he's an alien, I don't really mind them. In future Ranger series, they'll start introducing civilian powers, and I'll get to my feelings about them on a per-season basis. The Rangers overhear Bulk and Skull talking about seeing the Dark Fortress, and run off to get the last of the supplies and head back for the ship. After a fight with some Quantrons, we meet Astronema's right-hand man, Ecliptor. Ecliptor, as we'll discover, is one of the more well-developed villains, though in the early episodes, he's just a badass, easily able to walk through the Rangers without too much difficulty. However, we've now reached a point that I've been dreading. There is one episode of this series that is infamous to many. And it's why I had it be the intro to this video. No, you're not seeing things. Those are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
At the same time as Power Rangers in Space was on the air, there was also a live-action TMNT series called Ninja Turtles The Next Mutation. It's equally infamous among Turtles fans for the introduction of a female turtle, Venus, and the idea that the turtles aren't really biological brothers. I admit watching it as a little kid and liking it, but it really was not that good. In fact, it only lasted one season, 26 episodes, and of those, at least two were clip shows. I don't even know how the hell you have a clip show when you have only one season, much less two. Clip shows are usually done as a budget saver, but if your budget was so crappy to need two in a normal length season, why even bother with the show at all? Although what the hell do I know? Power Rangers would end up doing the same thing in later seasons. One or two clip shows per season. I also find the idea of this crossover kind of humorously ironic, because when Mighty Morphin Power Rangers premiered, it was actually seen by some as a ripoff of Ninja Turtles. Mostly because of the complicated name, but still, that was a thing. The episode goes like this. Astronema brainwashes the turtles to work for her and has them trick the rangers into letting them onboard the megaship. Once there, they take over, the brainwashing gets undone, turtles and rangers win the day. The dialogue is awful and head-scratching at points, like when the turtles tell Astronema that the Power Rangers don't really exist. Um... The Rangers were on a talk show once. There are frequent monster attacks reported by the news saying that the Rangers are engaging the monsters. Angel Grove even has special rules and regulations related to monster attacks. Also, whoever was in charge of the turtles' face animatronics and lining up their voices really dropped the ball. The male turtles all sound exactly the same and they never look like they're really speaking. Not helped by the fact that while they use the suits from Next Mutation, the voice and suit act are different from the regular show, evidently due to Power Rangers being produced in California while Ninja Turtles was produced in Canada. Despite how bizarre and terrible this episode is, there is an amusing bit where Raph hits Elgar. And I like seeing Elgar get hit. In fact, let's see that again. Ha! That's for Zordon's tube, you cone-headed freak! As time goes on, we learn a bit more about Andros' backstory. His sister, Corone, was kidnapped by a monster as a little girl, and he continues to search for any sign of her even to this day. In addition, his homeworld, again, the oddly named KO-35, wouldn't you call your own planet something other than a number? Was attacked by the forces of evil long ago, forcing the population to leave it. Andros has his own character development over the course of the series, related mostly to learning how to accept the help of the other rangers. By the by, what the hell was up with Astronomer's hair? She kept changing its color every other episode. While there were some filler episodes, a lot of them served different purposes, both thematically and to show the rangers weren't just resting on their laurels. For example, Satellite Search showed the rangers continue their search for Zor on. Wasp with a heart, while technically filler, is actually something we'll get to when we explore the themes of this season, especially since, despite some melodrama, it's an episode that perfectly encapsulates the season's overarching story. However, the main search for Zordon was continued in The Delta Discovery. Fortunately, the Space Rangers aren't the only ones hunting for Zordon. The Phantom Ranger has been tracking Divatox, who's in charge of holding Zordon. The Phantom Ranger sends a signal to our heroes to get their help, but he's discovered by Divatox. I guess losing his ruby last season weakened him or something, because he has a major problem contending with the Piranatrons, despite being able to easily kick their asses last time. Of course, the rangers immediately spring into action and speed off to the planet, but sadly arrive too late and Zordon is moved before they can reach him. The Phantom Ranger is intercepted by Astronema and the Quantrons, overwhelming him. Before the Phantom Ranger collapses, he gives them the location of the Delta Megaship, another vessel and Zord that they can use. When they try to find him again, he's already left, but he does leave a farewell message to Cassie to tie up their kinda, sorta, not really romance from last season. There was evidently a plan to finally explain the origins of the Phantom Ranger, or at least clear up his identity. In fact, I've read that there was a scene filmed in the season finale that would have finally revealed who he was, but was removed when said finale was supposed to be three parts and then got shortened to two. According to writer Judd Lynn, they simply ran out of time to come up with an answer of who the Phantom Ranger was, though apparently Shuki Levy did have a pitch for him being an embodiment of the spirits of fallen Power Rangers of the past, or a... Ghost Robot, which 
Sounds absolutely ridiculous and awesome, and now I'm wondering why I don't see ghost robots in more media. The Delta Megazord is cool in its own right, with Gatling gun hands, but of course all the best Megazords combined together. As such, the two Megazords are capable of merging and kicking even more ass. Along with it was the Battleizer, which both controlled the Delta Megaship, as well as gave Andros an advanced armor and weapon, aka a new toy to sell. As I said, in some filler episodes, we'd frequently see the Rangers heading out to different planets searching for signs of Zordon. Now, this would get sidetracked for some reason, but at least the Rangers were making an effort in checking planets. We're gonna go check out a planet in the Degaba system. We'll be back maybe a couple hours. And hell, if Yoda can't help them find Zordon, who can? As time went on, we also met Darkonda, a treacherous bounty hunter who once worked with Eclipter. While Eclipter is more of a dark knight, Darkonda is gleefully evil, delighting in causing pain, and continually makes plans to benefit himself. After Darkonda manages to trick Astronema into letting him serve as Eclipter's equal, Andro studies the video record of his sister's kidnapping and realizes that it was Darkonda who took her. Come to think of it, why does he have that? Who recorded it? Andros follows Darkondo to a villain planet that, as I mentioned earlier, weirdly resembles an old west town, and he manages to get his hands on some key cards that used to belong to Zordon, thanks to a game of space poker, as well as learning that his sister is alive. After an intense fight with Darkonda, the rangers head out to one of Jupiter's moons based on the information in the key cards, discovering a new set of zords, the Mega Voyager. Zordon had apparently hidden them there in case of an emergency. Like when the rangers broke the Thunder Zords, or when the command center got blown up, or when Eltar was under attack. Um, anyway, they're up to three Megazords now. Darkonda ends up destroyed at the end of the encounter, but we soon learn that Darkonda actually has extra lives. No, seriously, he has extra lives, though we've yet to see if he has a saved game he can load or additional continues. Anyway, since it was believed that space would be the last season, there was some more cleanup to be done for the previous season. Specifically, Storm Blaster and Lightning Cruiser, who had been taken by Divatox at the end of Turbo. The two cars have been enslaved, basically being forced by Piranatrons to haul cargo across a desert planet. Storm Blaster manages to escape and heads off to Earth. Divatox asks Astronema to let her know if she sees it, but of course Astronema plans to take the car for herself. The Rangers try to defend it, but are captured. With no other place to go, Storm Blaster goes to Justin for help. Justin's really good here as we see him worrying about the Rangers, obviously not able to keep in touch because, well, they've been in space and all. I wish my friends are okay. Storm Blaster brings him to the others and reveals a spare morpher for his turbo powers. Admittedly, no idea where the power for the morpher comes from, since the rangers lost their powers when Eltar was conquered, but if I had to hazard a guess, it's probably tied directly into Storm Blaster. Either that, or the power loss for the turbo powers was only temporary, and the rangers just didn't know. The point is, as the episode is titled, it's True Blue to the Rescue, as Justin comes to the aid of the others. After destroying the monster, the rangers head off to rescue lightning cruiser and succeed. However, we never see them aiding the group anymore like they did before, so we never learn their ultimate fate. My guess is that they joined up with Justin to defend the Earth in whatever city he ended up moving to at the end of Turbo. We never see Justin lose his morpher or anything, so one can probably assume he still has it at the end of the episode. The end with him saying goodbye really highlights the better writing for the season. I think about you guys a lot. I wonder if you're okay. Sure, I admit, Justin could get grading sometimes, but he was still one of the team and they all cared about each other. However, while two Blue Rangers working together might not have worked, it turns out there is a sixth Ranger that none of them knew about. After the Rangers are chased off a planet by some Jawas, the Rangers discover a hidden chamber in the engine room with a Ranger in cryogenic suspension and being monitored by medical equipment. Andros reveals that it's Zane, the Silver Ranger. He and Zane used to be a team, until the day Dark Spectre's forces attacked KO-35 and wrecked it. During the fight, Zane destroyed a monster, but took the full force of its explosion. Zane was alive, but severely injured. Andros put him in the cryogenic tube with the hope that the unit would heal him over time. However, there's no guarantee that it'll work, or how long the process would take. As a result, Zane has been in the tube for two years. The incident with Zane helps explain why Andros preferred to work alone and didn't want to have the others join him at the beginning of the season. He didn't want anyone else to get hurt, and it was just safer to work alone. While he doesn't blame himself for the incident, he owed his friend for saving his life, possibly at the cost of his own. 
Ashley asks him why he never told them, but he doesn't answer. My guess would be that he didn't want them to know firsthand that sometimes a ranger doesn't survive the harsher aspects of the superhero life. After all, Zane has been in the tube for two years now with no guarantee that his condition is improving, so he might as well be dead anyway. And it's entirely possible that it could happen to the rest of them. Damage to the megaship forces it to crash and the Jawas attack again. They do more external damage to the ship, which naturally causes the healing chamber where Zane is stored to malfunction. He flatlines, but the jolt wakes him up. He comes out none the worse for wear, and the team unites to destroy a monster. Zane has his own special weapon, the Super Silverizer. It's a gun that becomes a sword, which of course makes it awesome. Zane himself, personality-wise, is kind of a smug bastard, but loyal and friendly. However, we quickly learn something's wrong with him. He keeps demorphing when he doesn't want to. Hey, you shouldn't demorph here. Someone might see you. Oh no, someone might not recognize him. What? Alpha examines him and discovers that while he was in his morphed state in the cryo chamber, his morphing power was slowly leaking, like a parked car that's still running. He needs a concentrated burst of electrical energy right into his body, so he heads for a lightning storm and holds up his morpher. This is the sort of thing that usually results in a Darwin Award, but instead it fully revitalizes his powers. Following that, Zane rescues Astronema when one of her monsters starts attacking her. This builds towards the idea of the two getting into a romance, but sadly nothing really comes from it, because Zane has to miss their date to stop a monster. In the following episode, though, Astronema still seems to be pining for him. However, the real thing to note is that Astronema ditches her black leather for a few brief minutes. Now, isn't that interesting? Zane briefly leaves the team for a few episodes when the Rangers, while tracking an energy source that may be Zordon, discovers a force of rebels from KO-35. Zane decides to stay to help the rebels against Dark Spectre, but says he'll return when they need him. Following this, there was one more team up with a former Ranger. Always a chance. During a fight with a monster, Carlos accidentally hits Cassie with his weapon, severely injuring her arm. Carlos, worried about possibly hurting her or one of the others again, keeps second-guessing himself and considers leaving the team. He engages the monster again single-handedly, but he's almost defeated if not for someone stepping in to save him at the last minute. <laughs> It's great to see Adam in action again, just wailing on the monster and forcing it to retreat. Adam offers to help Carlos do some training to help hone his skills so he'll be less likely to make mistakes. After a training montage and an attempt at blind fighting, Carlos still is shaky and questioning himself. I can't do this. You're wasting your time. I'm no Power Ranger. Man, I can't do this guy. After Carlos sulks off, Adam and Alpha talk, with Adam commenting that he sometimes wishes he was still a ranger. Turns out he even still has his old morpher, though Alpha insists that he not use it. The power coins were destroyed, which means morphing could destroy you. Don't worry, Alpha. It was just a thought. It's quite an interesting thought, though, isn't it? The idea that maybe the old powers are not completely gone. Carlos decides to quit being the Black Ranger, but when the Quantrons attack him and Adam, Adam decides he needs to try using his Morpher, even while Alpha and Adam yell at him not to. While the morph is successful, clearly it's not working at full strength, as his powers keep cutting out and returning. Carlos regains his confidence and helps the rangers defeat the monster. It should be noted that despite Alpha's objection to Adam using the morpher is that the power coins were destroyed, Adam doesn't invoke the ninja powers. Both the power coin and the phrase he calls out are for the original Mastodon coin. Which makes sense. The ninja power coins were indeed destroyed but not the originals. The power surge that wrecked the Zords and purportedly destroyed their original powers was, well, just that, a power surge. I can see that it would damage their morphers in the coins, as we see with all the scarring and cracks on Adam's morpher, but sometimes even broken electronics can still partially function. The fact that he can still morph also suggests that the powers can be repaired. It would make sense that Zordon couldn't repair them himself, since, as we learned, he didn't create the coins, but discovered them. He would have no idea how to really fix them. And given the fact that the Space Rangers were able to learn the advanced technology and technobabble of the megaship, it's not so far out that the Rangers could study the technology behind the morphers and the coins and fully repair them at some point. Yeah, I know, it's a bit of a leap, but I think it's the best explanation for what we're going to see in some future episodes. 
In any case, Always a Chance is a great episode, with some nice introspection and character development for Carlos, plus it's just great to see Adam in the old Mighty Morphin suit. Watching the episode as a kid was magical, especially since it's not like there were a lot of spoilers for Power Rangers or trailers hyping the appearance on the internet at the time. It just happened, and by that point, the idea of seeing the original suits and powers at any point after Zeo was shocking and wonderful. The story continues as Andros takes on Darkonda, trying to get more information on his sister. We see yet another flashback to Caron's kidnapping, which can probably be counted as its own morphing sequence at this point, considering how often they've shown it. We also learn Astronomer's backstory, that she was left on Ecliptor's doorstep, and he's raised her since she was a child. Ecliptor claims that her family was destroyed by the power Rangers. After learning that, if you have two functioning brain cells, you should have figured it out. Astronoma is Corone, raised to be evil. Upon Andros discovering Astronoma's pendant contains pictures of them as children, the two discover the truth about each other. Astronoma at first doesn't believe it, but the more she thinks about it, the more sense it makes. Ecliptor admits the truth to her, but she says it doesn't matter, that she's still evil to the core. We get a truly epic fight between Darkonda and Ecliptor that takes up the first several minutes of an episode. Sure, Darkonda survives, save for another lost life, but Ecliptor really puts up a great fight. It's another cool first for this season, evil generals fighting each other on this kind of scale. After all, it's not like Goldar ever battled Rito or anything like that. Astronema is told by Dark Spectre to destroy Andros to prove her loyalty. She goes to Andros and tells him that she knows where Zordon is, and she's brought to the megaship. The Rangers, not being totally rock stupid, insist that she be restrained. It's understandable. Tommy and Kat in the past were welcomed with open arms, but they were both under mind control. Astronema, on the other hand, has been raised to be totally evil, and the evidence they have isn't enough to fully trust her yet. However, she gives them Zordon's location, and the rangers speed off to finally find him. There are some really good bits here, like Astronema asking about her and Andros' parents. It's short and lasts just long enough to provide character development, nor is it some cheesy link to her turning good at the end. Astronema makes Dark Spectre believe that she's captured the rangers, and he lowers the force field around the planet. A squad of Velasa fighters, the fighter craft that Astronema launches from her dark fortress, escort the megaship, but because the rangers are uncertain of where they're leading the ship, they change course. An atmospheric storm, however, causes the megaship to be struck by lightning, and they crash on the planet. When Andros checks on Astronema, he finds her gone and the cargo bay doors open. The rangers conclude that she was leading them into a trap. Because of the possibility that Zordon is on the planet, though, the rangers go searching through the forest. During a battle, Astronema leads Andros away and right to Zordon. Wow, finally reunited with him after so long! Andros, I... I can't believe that you're still such a fool. Huh? Huh. You know, I always suspected Zordon was an asshole, but I never got confirmation until now. Nah, it's Dark Spectre. Zordon isn't on the planet. Astronema claims that it was all a trap, but Dark Spectre insists on having her destroy them as her final test. However, she can't go through with it and saves them, Ecliptor coming to help her as well, despite being injured. Yeah, Ecliptor is evil, but he still loves Astronema as a father to her. They try to take him with them, but Ecliptor is overrun and insists they get her out of there. Astronema's pretty badass here too, smacking around Darkonda for good measure and blasting some Piranatrons. A pity she doesn't keep the staff later, it's really useful. Darkonda is given temporary command of the Dark Fortress, with Dark Spectre saying that Astronema will return and her loyalty will never stray again. Dark Spectre puts his plan into motion the next episode, launching a huge asteroid at Earth. Astronema says she can sneak back aboard the Dark Fortress and stop the asteroid, but she's stopped by Ecliptor, who's been given cybernetic enhancements and reprogrammed to be totally loyal to Dark Spectre. With no other options left, the Rangers use the three Megazords to try to push the asteroid out of the path of Earth. However, the three Megazords just aren't enough at first. Salvation arrives with Zane, who comes in with his own Megazord, the Mega Winger. After pushing the asteroid away, Andros and Zane travel to the Dark Fortress to try to rescue rescue Astronema, but when they discover her, she's been given cybernetic implants as well. What did they do to you? I am Locutus, a Borg. Astronema's even more cold and dark than before, usually displaying no emotion save for a frightening glare at anything she sees. Analysis by Decca indicates that Corone is still inside of her, but the computer programming is controlling her actions, and there's no way to get through to her in her present state.
Hello my friends, please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon.